You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Have you ever gazed in wonder at the Great Pyramid? Have you marveled at the golden face of Tutankhamun? Or admired the delicate features of Queen Nefertiti? If you have, you'll probably like the History of Egypt podcast. Every week, we explore tales of this ancient culture. The History of Egypt is available wherever you get your podcasting fix. Come, let me introduce you to the world of Ancient Egypt. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 170, The Invasion of Norway Part 8, Narvik. This week, a big thank you goes out to Nicholas, Matthew, and Jordan for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. Over the last several episodes, the podcast has looked at the various areas of Norway that the Germans would target during the opening hours of their invasion. This episode will continue that process with a look at the German efforts to land an amphibious force at Narvik in northern Norway. Narvik is an interesting area to discuss for a lot of reasons, but one of them was simply that it was also the area that the British and French were most concerned with taking control of during their discussions in the months before the German invasions. This meant that after the German invasion, it would also occupy a large amount of discussion in London and Paris about what to do about the German forces that were in Narvik. Narvik was important because it was on the route that Swedish iron ore took on its way to Germany during the winter months when the ports in the Baltic were frozen over. While the Norwegians would not know how close those British and French plans came to being put into action, they were still concerned that something might happen in Narvik. And so, due to those concerns, when they were coupled also with concerns of a possible Soviet action, that would cause the 6th Norwegian Division in northern Norway to be partially mobilized in January 1940. Now, this mobilization was not targeted at any individual threat, but was kind of just the general threat posed by all of Norway's possible enemies, in the belief that Narvik and northern Norway would be a target for any nation that was looking to attack Norway. The partial mobilization would put the Norwegian troops in northern Norway in a much better place to meet the German aggression in early April. The most important way in which this was felt was on the supply and support perspective, allowing the Norwegian troops to be prepared not just to mount a resistance against an attack, but a more prolonged defense of all of northern Norway. While the Norwegian troops in northern Norway were more prepared, in Narvik itself, they were also able to take advantage of some defenses that had been built before the war. Over the previous 50 years, there had been various coastal artillery batteries put in place on the approaches to Narvik. Unfortunately for the troops in 1940, many of those were no longer active when the Germans came to invade. The man who was put in charge of the defense of northern Norway was Major General Fleischer, and he would tour the defenses of Narvik on March 7th. And after his tour, he was kind of of two minds about what he saw. On the one hand, over the previous two months, the troops available had been working really hard to improve the defensive positions around Narvik and on the approaches into the city. But... There was still a lot of work to be done, and right up until the German invasion, there would be construction happening, with some defenses not even really getting started until late March 1940, when there were orders put out for bunkers and artillery positions to be added to the path into Narvik. While this short-term work was making an improvement, for months, Fleischer had been trying to get more resources for his defensive efforts of Narvik. He asked multiple times for more resources, to complete some of the planned fortifications, both in terms of manpower and also in terms of things like concrete and artillery guns and and those types of items. However, these requests were turned down due to a lack of resources, men, and money. 
Due to these defenses not being completed, the general plan for the defense of Narvik was not focused on stopping an invader on the beaches. Any troops in or near the city would likely be completely vulnerable to naval fire from the fjord, and so the greater emphasis was placed on creating prepared positions to fall back on to the east of the city along their railway to Sweden. One of these would be near Seldvik, 20 kilometers east of Narvik, based on some positions that were created during the First World War. This had artillery and machine guns, along with an armored train with a 75mm artillery gun on it, and so it was a relatively solid blocking position. Because the plan was to mount the main land defense to the east of Narvik in the days before the German invasion, there were not many infantry troops in Narvik itself, and most of the soldiers in the area were either there as construction engineers or manned the anti-aircraft batteries that had been installed to ward off any air attacks. The commander of Narvik itself was Colonel Sundelo, but he had fully committed to the plan of evacuating the city as soon as the enemy began serious landing operations, even though that's not what would end up happening. Just like other military leaders all over Norway, Fleischer began to get information about possible German actions on April 8th. Throughout the day, reports began to arrive from both the British and then from other sources that German troops had been spotted and were possibly on their way to Norwegian targets, including Narvik. But these reports were also mixed in with reports that the British had mined the waters near Vestfjord, which was on the approaches to Narvik, which made the entire situation more confusing. This advanced warning did provide some additional time for the Norwegian forces to prepare, and additional reinforcements were moved into Narvik. However, these forces would not arrive until 9 p.m. on April 8th, which was just hours before the German invasion began, and they were not moved into their defenses immediately. Instead, Sundlow would play kind of the long game with these troops, and instead, he had them move into quarters for the night, under the theory that they were wet and cold and tired after traveling, and they would be better served by being given a few hours to rest and dry out. This would put them in a very bad position when the German invasion came, but it should be said that if the Germans had waited even 12 hours or or another day, it would have been the better decision. The troops were kept at high readiness, you know, with their uniforms and equipment on and with their officers with them to allow for them to move quickly from their quarters uh, out into the defenses as quickly as possible. One of the reasons for this more cautious decision was that the Norwegian military leaders did not expect that the Germans would launch an attack on Narvik as part of an operation against southern Norway. Instead, when the information was passed to Fleischer that the British were reporting German ship movements, that information came along with the comment that it seemed likely that Narvik would not be a target. Instead, the Norwegians were thinking that maybe the Germans would attack southern Norway, you know, capture some things down there, and then have Narvik be a second operation uh, later. We, of course, know that the Germans were already absolutely on their way directly to Narvik, with the naval troops under Task Force 1 consisting of 10 destroyers on their way to Narvik itself. Each of the destroyers would carry around 200 troops, making for a total of 2,000 men of the 139th Mountain Regiment of the 3rd Mountain Division. These troops would be under the command of Major General Deitel when they landed, and his orders were somewhat different than what had been given to other units around Norway. He had been given orders from Falkenhorst, the commander of the Norwegian operation, which included a very firm statement that the general economy and infrastructure around Narvik should be disrupted as little as possible during the invasion. And in fact, it was stressed that all objectives should be achieved with the minimal required amount of violence and destruction. This included any captured Norwegian troops who should simply be disarmed and sent home instead of detained. Similar orders were also given to the naval commanders in the area, with statements that objectives should be accomplished as peacefully as possible, and that German ships should only return direct fire. Warning shots were not considered justification for engagement. Now, everybody knew that it was very unlikely that the objectives of the invasion could be met without any destruction and violence, but the goal was to minimize the impact and disruption caused to the iron ore trade. They wanted to get the trade back online as soon as possible after the invasion, and that meant that they needed a working port, they needed working rail lines, you know, they needed a working city to make that happen. Speaking of the objectives of the attack on Narvik, there were three key areas of focus for the German troops, 
The first was the destruction or disablement of the fortifications that the Germans believed existed on the approaches to Narvik. These were the defenses that the Norwegians were planning to build, which were not yet completed, but the Germans didn't know that. The next objective was, of course, the capture of Narvik itself. And then the final objective was the capture of the important Norwegian army depot at Elvgardsmon. The German plan was to attack these three objectives as close to simultaneously as possible, with three different sets of troops. Group West would focus on the Norwegian defenses, Group Narvik would focus on Narvik, and Group Elfgardsmon would, you guessed it, focus on Elfgardsmon. The German ships on their way to these destinations would enter Offutfjord on the way to Narvik a little after 3 a.m. in the morning, and as soon as they made this move, they would be spotted by two Norwegian ships, and this information would be communicated via radio to the troops ashore. However, at this time, Sundlow would not learn of these reports due to the problems with a telephone line. And so instead of having an hour's warning of the impending German invasion, Sundlow and the Norwegian defenders would only get a few minutes. The German group that would experience the least resistance would be Group West, who would be put ashore and launch an attack on Norwegian defenses that did not exist. For several hours, these troops would then continue to search for the Norwegian defenses, believing that perhaps they were in the wrong place or they were concealed, but of course it is really hard to find things that do not exist. So at 7 a.m., these troops would get back aboard their transports and they would go to Narvik. The next German assault would come at Elfgardsmon by the cleverly named group Elfgardsmon. Elfgardsmon was important as a major mobilization center in the region, with weapons, ammunition, and supplies that were required by the Norwegian military if it wanted to move from a partial mobilization to a full mobilization. This also made it an important target for the Germans, not just to prevent the supplies from being used by the enemy, but also so that they could use them themselves if they needed to. One of the facts of the actions at Narvik was that there was always a risk that a German resupply effort would be delayed due to British action. This made it important for Norwegian defenses to be squashed early to conserve resources, but it also made any captured weapons and supplies more important. The German troops detailed for this attack would successfully land, and the defending troops would have just 15 minutes warning before they arrived. There were two major problems that the Norwegians would have to deal with here. The first was that concern about a surprise invasion was so low that the troops here, defending these supplies, did not even have live ammunition, and so that would have to be distributed. The much larger problem is that to meet the German attack, there were precisely 17 Norwegians in the depot. Obviously, those 17 men could not do much about the German attack, and Elfgardsmon would be quickly in German hands. The interesting part of this attack is that it was at Elfgardsmon that the Germans were expecting the most resistance, to the point where there was roughly 2,000 men put ashore uh, in all of the Narvik operations, and almost two-thirds of them, over 1,200, were dedicated to the attack on Elfgardsmon against what would turn out to be precisely 17 Norwegians. This was a complete miscalculation of the importance that the Norwegians placed on the depot, and in other situations, may have been a serious problem for the Germans. While the first two German attacks were going very well and would experience almost no resistance, back on the water, the German destroyers were still on their way to Narvik. They would be able to use periodic snow squalls to help hide their movements, making it more difficult for them to be consistently spotted by the Norwegians. At around 4.15 a.m., the lead German destroyers would be challenged by the Norwegian coastal defense ship, the Eidsvold, A signal light was used to present a challenge to the German ship, and then the signal flags were raised that were internationally recognized as the signal to stop. A warning shot was then fired, which was a bit concerning for the German destroyers because while the Eidsvold was old, it still had two 21cm guns and six 15cm guns and several smaller ones. At the short range that the engagement would occur in the fjord, those guns could still be dangerous. This put the captain of the German destroyers, Captain Bonte, in a tight spot. If he followed the part of the orders that he had been given that had demanded that the Norwegians fire the first shot, he risked major damage to his ship. One of those 21cm shells would devastate, or could devastate, a German destroyer. But that part of the order was balanced against the order to accomplish his mission and to put troops ashore at Narvik. He made his decision quickly to prioritize that mission and four torpedoes were ordered to be fired at the Norwegian ship. These torpedoes would hit at exactly the moment 
that the Norwegians were preparing to fire on the German ship, with the order to fire having been given just as three German torpedoes exploded against the side of the Eidsvold. Three torpedoes against an old, small coastal defense ship were devastating, and the ship would sink in just 15 seconds, and only six men of the 181-man crew would survive the night. The Eidsvold would just be the first Norwegian ship that the destroyers would encounter. The next would be in the harbor at Narvik, where another coastal defense ship, the Norge, would take up position near the Iron Ore Pier, where it could be ready to fire on any German ships that entered into the port. It did not take long for two German destroyers to be spotted, and as the Germans moved in closer, the Norge would open fire. Shots that would be fired just as the German ships were pulling up to the pier to try and get the infantry off of the ship. Because they were trying to get the infantry off of their ships, the destroyers were stationary and at their most vulnerable. But they also began to return fire, although just like the fire of the Norge, the German shells were inaccurate and would not cause any damage. But the German destroyers had weapons even more deadly than their guns, torpedoes, five of which would be fired at the Norge. Three of the torpedoes would miss, but then two of them would hit. And just like the Eisvold, the Norge would quickly sink, only about a minute after the torpedoes exploded. Only 90 of the 191 men aboard would survive. While news of the German actions did not reach Colonel Sundlow and the Norwegian defenders inside of Narvik as early as it could have, they did still have time to prepare a response before the German infantry landed at Narvik. Now, the exact strength and intentions of the Germans was unknown, but there was a clear understanding of the troops available for the defense. If Sundlo wanted to try and hold the city, and remember that was never the long-term goal of the Norwegian forces, but just as a delaying action, as their real defensive lines were readied further inland, he would have at his disposal 775 men. The problem was that about 250 of that 775 were not trained infantry troops. They were support and service troops with little combat training. So the real number was actually around 530. Another problem was that around half of that number were the late-arriving reinforcements that Sundlow did not consider to be a real option for deployment because they'd spent most of the previous day sort of on their way to Narvik through the snow. Another major problem that Sundlow faced at this time, and that he would discuss at length with his officers, was that the forces under his command were heavily dispersed. Due to the weather, the troops had been spread around the town in small groups to allow them to be housed easily and so it would be challenging to bring them all together so that they could fight as a unit. It was even possible that because of the lack of notice of the German actions, there was simply no longer time to actually bring the troops together before they would have to be put into action. This fear very quickly became a reality, as the Germans quickly began advancing into Narvik, which cut off many of the dispersed Norwegian groups, changing the efforts to concentrate them for a counterattack from difficult to impossible. What would follow would be a long list of stories of small units of Norwegian soldiers hearing gunfire, trying to get organized, and then being captured by the Germans before they could really go into action. This is what would happen to the anti-aircraft battery, which would be one of the many units that would be alerted to action as as the naval gunfire was happening in the harbor. The officer in charge would order his men to their gun positions, and they would move to cars that had been parked for this very purpose, only to be captured by a unit of German infantry who were moving through Narvik. A similar story would happen to the crew of one of the 75mm artillery pieces that was positioned to defend the harbor. The problem for the crew of the gun was that it was only positioned to fire into the fjord, but since the German troops had already landed, it would have been more useful if it could fire at shore-based targets, but it couldn't. With this fire being impossible due to the positioning of some rocks that blocked the gun from being able to fire into the city. Even in areas where there were weapons that might have been useful, for example a platoon of mortars that were positioned to fire into the harbor and could have engaged the German ships, orders were confused and it would delay their impact. In the case of the mortar platoon, they were ordered to go to their mortars, but then when they arrived they were ordered back to battalion headquarters to participate in a counterattack. The end result of all of these moves and the continued discussion among Sundlow and his officers was that no real action by the Norwegian defenders happened. 
In the case of the defense of Narvik, a lack of action was the worst possible action that could be taken, because it gave the German forces more time to get organized, to consolidate their positions, and to move units around the city, isolating and neutralizing a growing number of Norwegian troops. While discussion continued, a German officer would arrive at Sundlo's headquarters and deliver a request from the German officer in command of the forces that were ashore for the commander of the Norwegian troops to meet with him. Sundlo decided to meet with the Germans himself, bringing with him one of his subordinates, a major. The major would later report that at least initially, Sundlo handled the conversation with confidence, bordering on overconfidence, with the major's account saying, quote, The German officer stated, as soon as we met him, we will not fire if you don't fire. Colonel Sundlow answered immediately, On the contrary, we will fire. If you don't withdraw immediately, we will open fire. End quote. But this very bellicose response was tempered as the conversation continued, and eventually the agreement that was made would be for a 30-minute ceasefire while Sundlow contacted his superiors to discuss the situation. The German officer would agree to this, First, because of his orders to accomplish his goals with the minimum amount of bloodshed, which is what he was trying to do here, but also because it was massively to the German advantage to have this ceasefire. As would be clear time and time again, during an amphibious landing, every minute that the invaders have before they meet major resistance is massively beneficial to maintaining their beachhead. More men came ashore, more material comes ashore, more positions are organized, more territory is taken. The only thing that would happen in a 30-minute ceasefire is that the Germans would be even more prepared to either attack or to resist any Norwegian counterattacks when the ceasefire expired. During this time, the Germans would move on a few important pieces of terrain and then were also able to place machine guns to cover many obvious avenues of possible Norwegian attack. During this ceasefire, Sunload returned to his headquarters and called his commanders back at the Norwegian Defense District headquarters, with the call being placed at around 6 a.m. The discussion would revolve around whether or not a defense of the city should be mounted, with Sundlow's concern being that if there was fighting in Narvik, it was very likely that the only outcome would be that there would be heavy civilian casualties and the destruction of their homes without really delaying the German actions. There was also the known problems of Norwegian units being cut off while others had become hopelessly intermingled with German units and with civilians who were out and about, curious to see what was going on. This made many of the units that Sundlow did still have contact with almost combat ineffective. While Sundlow was very concerned, the initial call to headquarters was indecisive, with Sundlow believing that the city was probably already lost. The request was made to the German commander for the ceasefire to be extended, but now General Dietl changed tactics. He felt that the first ceasefire had given his troops plenty of time to defend themselves and to prepare for what was next, and the Norwegians seemed very hesitant. These two facts caused Dietl to escalate instead of de-escalate, to force a decision on Sundlow. This forced Sundlow to make a decision basically immediately, and the decision he would make would be simply communicated with the phrase, I surrender the city, with the surrender being completed at 6.15 a.m. Sundlow was escorted back to his headquarters in the minutes that followed so that he could inform his headquarters and then all of the Norwegian units that he was in communication with that he had surrendered to the Germans, with the message being delivered to General Fleischer back at Norwegian Defense District Headquarters at 6.20 a.m. While Sundlow had decided to surrender the city, not all of the Norwegian officers under his command agreed with that decision, and General Fleischer would be able to order some of them to break out of Narvik. The senior-most officer to be given this order was Major Amdal, and Fleischer informed him that he should get as many troops together as possible and try to bring them out of Narvik along the rail line to add to its defense. The result of this order would be for around 180 Norwegian troops to be brought together, primarily pieces of the 1st and 3rd Infantry Companies and a machine gun platoon. They were quickly assembled with their weapons and ammunition and limited other supplies, and they would begin marching out of the city. As they approached a German unit that was blocking their path, the German challenge was met with a response from one of the Norwegian officers of, We are marching, good morning. But the key was, is that this Norwegian officer knew how to speak German. The German response confused the German troops enough that they did not react as the Norwegians began marching past their positions. These Norwegians would then occupy some positions near a city to the east of Narvik to act as a blocking force if the Germans tried to move out along the railway, 
although they would later move further east to the Nordahl Bridge, simply because it was easier to defend. With the retreat of this group of Norwegian soldiers, the attack on Narvik was over, only hours after it had really began. During the attack, the Germans had sunk two of Norway's most heavily armed warships, captured the supply at Evangardsmund, and forced around 600 total Norwegian troops to surrender, and were also in complete possession of Narvik, at least for the moment. Thank you for listening to this episode of History of the Second World War. I hope you will join me next episode, which will cover the British reactions to the German invasion of Norway.